welcome everyone to uh, the second day on the road less traveled. And to start us off this morning, we have our invited speaker, Dr. Richard Pettigrew from the University of Bristol. And he is going to talk, us, talk to us about accuracy first epistemology. Thanks very much. Thanks very much to everyone for coming to the early slot. Um, thanks very much to Jill and um, Raphael for organizing this. And also thanks to everybody who shifted around their talks to accommodate my Eurostar um, sponsored disaster, um, travel-wise. So I'm going to talk about this project that I've been looking at for the um, last few years. Um, and it's a project where you try to give a justification for certain norms that govern um, credences, norms that govern um, doxastic states when they're represented um, as partial beliefs. Um, and its main focus, as the name suggests, is that it's all based around the notion of accuracy. Essentially, the core idea is that the only source, or the only fundamental source of epistemic value for credences is their accuracy. So the only way that they can get good, they can get, um, be good things for us to believe, is by being accurate. And then the idea is that we give a mathematical treatment to this notion of accuracy. And using that, we can justify a whole bunch of norms that we typically think govern um, these credences. For instance, probabilism, which just tells you that your credences should um, obey the axioms of the probability calculus. Or the principal principle, which tells you how your credences and your, um, your credences and other propositions and your credences about the chance proposition should interact. Or the principle of indifference, which tells you that you should divide your credences equally over all possibilities. Or conditionalization, which is a norm which tells you how you should change your credence in, uh, um, upon receipt of evidence. Okay, so I'm going to start off with a very, very simple norm. In some ways, I kind of think of this as the simplest norm that um, governs uh, credences, and in some ways, also the least controversial. And we'll see how we can use this accuracy-first approach to try to justify this norm. And then we'll slightly generalize this to the probabilism norm, and then we'll go through some of the others, and we'll see how far we get. Okay, so the norm that I'm going to be interested in to begin with is um, I'm going to call no drop. And it just says this. If you've got one proposition that entails another, then your credence in the first one shouldn't exceed your credence in the second one. So um, your credence in A should be at most your credence in B if A entails B. So here's a couple of consequences of this. Your credence in a conjunction should be at most your credence in either the conjunct. Your credence in a disjunct. Disjunction should be at least your credence in either of the disjuncts. The question is, why is it irrational to violate that norm? What goes wrong with me if I believe a conjunction more strongly than I believe one of its conjuncts? Well, the standard sort of answer to this is a pragmatic answer. Um, and, and this, so there's sort of two sorts of answers. I'm going to be talking about the second sort. The first sort is the most standard one, the pragmatic answer. And the two sorts of answers to this question come about by two different, um, two different ways in which credences feature in our lives, or two different uh, roles that credences are supposed to play. The first role is that they're supposed to guide our actions. The credences that we have go into, say, our decision theory, which tells us how we should um, choose what to act. And the second way is the credences are their doxastic states. So they're supposed to help us represent the world in a particular way. They're supposed to give our representation of the world. So let's take the first way. Credences are supposed to guide our actions. The pragmatic answer to the question, why is it irrational to violate no drop, is that if you were to violate it, then you would thereby have credences that would lead you to perform actions that were in some way suboptimal. So these are the, stand these are the sort of famous Dutch book arguments. Well, the Dutch book argument shows that if you violate a particular norm, then having, those, having the credences that make you violate that norm will lead you to take bets that will be suboptimal <coughs> in a particular way. They'll lose you money for sure, something like that. Now, I don't want to take any issue with those sorts of arguments. I mean, there are, I think there are problems with them. They've got to be neatened up in certain ways. There are um, all sorts of problems. But I don't want to reject that style of argument. What I want to say is instead it, get, it misses out something. It doesn't tell us all of the um, ways in which violating these norms is irrational. If I tell you that I believe a conjunction more strongly than I believe one of the conjuncts, 
Sure, you might say that's going to lead you into all sorts of troubles when you start making decisions using those credences, but you also seem to think there's something purely epistemically that's wrong with me. I'm doing something not just in the way that I'm going to act in the future that's bad, but um, there's just something in a purely epistemic sense that's wrong with me. And that's what I want to try to get at this accuracy first, epistemology. Okay. I mean, I should say that this project isn't sort of, doesn't origi originate with me. I mean, it originates really um, in a paper by Jim Joyce in 1998 called A Non-Pragmatic Vindication of Probabilism. And you see, what he's alluding to there is he's wanting to try to give a vindication of probabilism or a justification of the probabilistic norm that isn't pragmatic. So essentially what I'm going to describe is, first of all, the sort of argument that he's been giving and then extensions to it that I've been trying to give. Okay, so first of all, I need to set up the framework. Um, so the first thing is we just need a way of representing an agent's doxastic states. And as I say, we're representing them as uh, credences or partial beliefs. That's credences or partial beliefs. So we represent their state um, at a given time by their credence function at that time. Okay? And a credence function is just a function that takes um, each member of some set of propositions, f, and gives back some real number <coughs> in the closed unit interval, which is supposed to be a measure of how strongly that agent believes that proposition. Okay, so C of A is a measure of her, um, the agent's credence or degree of belief in that proposition. And F is a set of propositions about which she, uh, to which she assigns credences. I'm not assuming anything about the structure of F. I'm not assuming it's an algebra. I'm not assuming any closure conditions on it at all. It can be a set of um, any, any set of propositions will do. Okay, and my script C is going to be the set of all possible credence functions. So that's the first part. We've got our representation of the agent's um, epistemic states. And what we want to give in a couple of slides is a measure of an agent's accuracy. Because this, this is the sort of purpose of this accuracy first epistemology, um, is we're going to derive all these norms on the basis of the notion of accuracy. And an agent's accuracy depends on her credence function, but also the possible world that she's in, the world that she in fact inhabits. Because it's going to be a measure of how well she represents that world, how close she comes to a sort of perfect representation of that world. So we need possible worlds in, in there as well into our formal framework if we're going to do this. So we're going to represent possible worlds by classically consistent truth value assignments to the propositions in F. Okay? <clears throat> so I'm not sort of, there's not some sort of mysterious notion of possible worlds, not some notion of concrete possible worlds. It's just you take the propositions in F and you take all the classically consistent truth value assignments of them. Those are going to count as possible worlds. And this just sort of highlights the fact that all we're going to need in order to say how accurate or inaccurate an agent is at a world is we're just going to have to know what the truth values are of the propositions to which she assigns credences. Um, okay, and so W is going to be the set of all possible worlds. Okay, so now we're ready to um, define the sort of central <coughs> notion here, which is the notion of an inaccuracy measure. Now, I call it accuracy first epistemology, and then I talk a lot about accuracy, and I'll keep on talking a lot about accuracy. But just for mathematical reasons, it's easier to talk about inaccuracy measures. Okay? So measures of how badly an agent's doing with respect to her accuracy. And there's nothing mysterious about that mathematically. I'm just going to take accuracy to be the negative of inaccuracy and vice versa. Okay? So there's nothing sort of weird going on. But it's just mathematically that makes it a lot simpler. So an inaccuracy measure is a function like this. It takes um, an agent's credence function, and it takes the world that she inhabits, and it gives back some real number or infinity. Uh, sorry, some some non-negative real number or infinity. And that's meant to measure how inaccurate she is. So if it takes infinity, then she's kind of maximally inaccurate. If it takes zero, she's minimally inaccurate. But actually not all of the inaccuracy measures we talk about will, will take all of the uh, values in that range. Some of them will be will have a smaller range than that. But that's the sort of biggest range they could take. Okay, so that's inaccuracy measures. So um, first of all, how do we get our inaccuracy measures? So, so what we so what we've that's that's just a kind of schema. That's what an inaccuracy measure is like. And now we're going to define a particular inaccuracy measure, and then we're going to use it to do some work. And then I'll say in fact how you can generalize that. Okay, so. How, how do we measure how inaccurate an agent is? So here's one idea, and, and there are actually a number of them around. This, is a little, this one's maybe a little bit contentious, but you know, there are other ways of spelling this out. And not an awful lot's going to hang on this way of spelling it out. But here's one idea. How inaccurate an agent is, is how far she lies from the most perfectly accurate agent. Okay? 
So the idea is that for each possible world, there's a perfect agent, an agent who gets things just exactly right with respect to her credences. And then how inaccurate you are is how far you lie from that agent. So the, more ina- and the further you lie from her, the, the, um, the more inaccurate you are. OK, so first thing we need to say then, what is this perfect agent, this agent who gets things exactly right at a world? Well, the idea is just this. It's the agent who assigns maximal credence to all the truths of that world, so credence one to all the truths of that world, and minimal credence to all the falsehoods of that world. So if you like, it's the credence function that an omniscient agent would have. Okay? She gets things exactly right. Maximal credence of truths, minimal credence and falsehoods. So indeed, if she's at world W, that's her credence function. Zero if it's false, one if it's true. And so the second claim, perfectionism is the claim I, I articulated just a second ago, the accuracy of a credence function at world is its proximity to the ideal credence function at the world. OK, so we know what the perfect credence function is. It's this one. We now know that accuracy is inaccuracy is distance from that. But we've yet to give a definition of what distance is. OK, that's the last ingredient we need in order to give our inaccuracy measure. Well, I'm just going to give this distance function. I'm not going to say an awful lot about what makes it good. And later on, I'll say some other things. OK, so um, distance between credence functions is measured by what I'm going to call squared Euclidean distance. And basically, the, the reason it's called this is you can think of credence functions as vectors. Okay, so suppose you've got a credence function over a set of propositions which has n propositions in it. And throughout this whole thing, we're thinking of the set of propositions as finite. I should have said that. Okay, if you've got that, a credence function over a set of n propositions is clearly just going to be, um, uh, it can be represented as a vector in an n-dimensional vector space. In fact, it can be represented as a point in the n-dimensional unit cube um, or unit square. Okay, and then what we're going to take the distance to be is the square of the Euclidean distance between those two points. Okay, and there's nothing particularly mysterious about this. Another way to state it, which is a little bit less, less mathematical, is this. Um, how do I figure out how far two credence functions lie from each other? So how far, say, my credence function lies from Gilman's? I just take all the propositions that we have assigned credences to. I take the difference between the two of them, square them, and then add all of those squared differences up. Yeah. This is relativized to particular possible worlds, right? Or are you quantifying over them sort of passively? Um, in, in, at this point, in, in this bit? I mean, at the moment. In, so in, this is credence at particular worlds, right? No, this, at the moment, this is just credence functions, just generally, regardless of which possible world you're at. Okay, so I've got a credence function, okay. Jill's got a credence function, could be at different worlds, I guess. Um, it's just how far the credences lie from one another, the credence functions lie from one another. And the idea is just, well, we just go through each of the propositions, see how far they lie from one another, which is going to be their difference squared, and then add all of those uh, differences squared. OK, so that's, that's going to be our distance measure. So that gives us a measure of how inaccurate you are at a particular world. Your, the inaccuracy of your credence function at a world is your distance from the perfect credence function in that world. And the perfect credence function is the one that gives 0 to all the falsehoods, 1 to all the truths. And distance is measured by the squared Euclidean distance. Okay. So suppose I'm here. I've got my credence function. And, and there's also this, I'm at this particular <coughs> world. How inaccurate am I at that world? Well, I just go through all of my credences and see how far they lie from the perfect credence in that proposition in that world. Um, take their, their difference, square it, and then add them all up. The, the details of that aren't going to be inter- terribly important. We can come back to it later on. OK. Um, so now we want to give an argument. OK, so, so we've got all of the um, ingredients are in place now to give an argument for a no drop. Um, remember, no drop is the norm that if A entails B, then you shouldn't have a greater credence in A than in B. OK, so here's the theorem that we're going to rely on. And I mean, it's, yeah, I, I'm going to give a little picture of it in a second. But um, in any case, so suppose you've got credence functions. You can only allow credence functions over this, this particular set that we're interested in, A and B. It consists of A and B and A entails B. Then here's the following thing. If you've got a credence function that violates no drop, so it assigns greater credence to A than to B, then there's some credence function that satisfies it, 
that is more accurate, the second credence function is more accurate, that is less inaccurate, than the first credence function at all worlds. So regardless of how the worlds turn out, I know there's some other credence function that's more accurate than me. Or better, to get the quant make the quantifiers a bit clearer, there's some other credence function that I know is better than mine at every possible world. So I can know a priori that would be better than mine would be. Now you might think, oh well, that's, that's disastrous. Um, straight away that shows that I'm, I'm irrational. I'm, do I'm what decision theorists call strictly dominated. There's some option in this other credence function that's better than me at all worlds. But actually, that isn't sufficient for irrationality. Because it could be that, that, circum that, that every credence function has that property. Not just the ones that violate no drop, but in fact every credence function has the property that they're dominated. And if every option has the property that it's dominated, then it's not irrational to take any particular one. Take the example of um, the sort of name your fortune um, example in, in, in decision theory where God comes down and says, say a, a positive integer and I'll give you that many pounds um, or euros. Um, then each option that you <laughs> state is dominated. If I state 5 million, 5 million and 1 would have dominated me. But that doesn't mean that any particular one of those is irrational. So being dominated alone isn't enough for being irrational. What it, what's enough for being irrational is being dominated by something that isn't itself dominated. Okay, so what we've shown so far, that if you violate no drop, then you're dominated. That is, there's something that's better than you all worlds. But we don't know that there's anything that dominates you that isn't itself dominated. But in fact, the second bit of the theorem gives this as well. It says that if you satisfy no drop, if you satisfy that norm, there's nothing that's going to dominate you. In fact, there's not even something else that does at, at least as well as you at all. Okay, so let's see this in a little bit right, diagrammatically, which makes all this sort of thing quite a bit easier. Um, okay, so as I said before, um, if you think of a, a credence function over a set that has n propositions in it, you can think of that credence function just as a vector. Um, okay? So in particular, if you've got a credence function defined over a set that contains just two uh, propositions, then you can think of it as a vector in two-dimensional vector space. And in particular, in the two-dimensional unit square. So in fact, in the unit square itself. Um, okay, so what happens in there? Well, we essentially represent each credence function as a point in here. Its first coordinate is the credence that it gives to the proposition A, its second coordinate is the credence that it gives to the proposition B. Okay, so here's the credence function that gives 0.7 to A and 0.5 to B. Here's the credence function that gives 0.6 to both of them. Here's the credence function that gives 0 to both of them. Now that's going to be the perfect credence function at the world where they're both false. Okay? This one up here is the credence function that gives 1 to B and 0 to A. That's going to be the credence function that's perfect at the world where um, A is false and <coughs> A is uh, true. And then finally, the credence function up here, which gives 1 to both of them, is the credence function where they're both true. Now you might think, well, why is this one not also occupied? This would be the credence function that would be perfect if A were true, gives 1 to A, and B were false. But that's not a possible world, because remember, A entails B. Okay, so we don't have, so we just have three different possible perfect credence functions out there. W1, w, uh, VW1, VW2, VW3. Okay, so those are the, and, and so those are the ones that you want to try to get close to, yeah? So remember, accuracy is getting close to those perfect credence functions. So those are the ones you want to try to get close to. Now, last thing to about this diagram, this green, I guess you can see it, I hope it's not too light. This, this, anyway, this upper left triangle, this green triangle, that's the set of uh, credence functions that satisfies no drop, okay? The ones where your credence in A doesn't exceed your credence in B. Okay, that's enough in terms of the setup. Now we can see something. Suppose you violate no drop. That means you lie <coughs> outside this green triangle, because that's the one that everything satisfies it. So suppose you're here, for instance. Then it's hopefully clear just geometrically that you can find something inside this green triangle that is closer to each of these points than this one is. I mean, essentially what you do is you just drop a perpendicular down onto this and then Pythagoras theorem. 
um, to each of those points. And this is exactly what our theorem said, remember. If you lie outside this, then there's something inside it that dominates you, namely is closer to each of these, that is, is more accurate, however the world turns out. So that means you're irrational because you can know a priori there's something better that you could have. There's something better that you could have. Sorry, again, the quantifiers are important here. There's something better, <laughs> something you could have that you could know a priori will be better than yours. And that makes you irrational. You're dominant. Okay, so this is the epistemic, this is the, let's say, epistemic utility argument. The accuracy, um, accuracy first argument for no drop. The idea is that all we've appealed to here are two things. One is a definition of accuracy, a way of measuring how accurate a credence function is at a world. The other thing we've appealed to is a very uncontentious norm of decision theory, which says that if you're dominated by something which isn't itself dominated, then you're irrational. If there's something that you, you could know a priori is better than you, and it itself isn't dominated in that way, then you're irrational to choose the thing you've chosen. And so that gives us our argument for, um, for no drop. Now, um, in the interest of time, I won't go into this generalization in much detail, but no drop is essentially the simplest version of probabilism. <coughs> probabilism says, if you've got a credence function over a set of propositions, then that credence function should obey the probability axioms. I mean, really what it says, slightly more technically, is it should be extendable to a probability function on the smallest algebra <coughs> that contains that set. But, I mean, you get the idea. So, um, so probabilism is, is that norm. Uh, so it's a generalization of no drop. It tells you what you should do when you're, the set of propositions to which you assign credences is more complex or has different structure than the one that we, we've been looking at. We've been just looking at the set which contains A and B where A entails B. But of course we want to know about how our credences should be in more complex situations. Probabilism tells us how to do this. Um, and so probabilism, so, so the question might be, well, look, you can justify no drop as a very, very simple, very uncontentious norm in this way. But that's not terribly interesting. We don't come across many agents who only have credences in those two propositions. Um, can you generalize? And the answer is yes, you can. Because of the following theory, which is due to the finetic. Original. Okay, so Diffinetti's theorem goes like this. I mean, it's just exactly the same as the no drop theorem, but slightly more general. So it says if your credence function isn't a probability function, then there is some probability function that dominates you. Okay, so just exactly the same as before. If you've not got a probability function, there's some probability function that does better than you, regardless of how the world turns out. Second part of the theorem is if you have a probability function already, then there's nothing uh, that actually even does, no, no other thing that does at least as well as you. That should be no C prime distinct from C that does at le even at least as well as you. Okay, so the, the thing that dominates you is not going to be um, itself <coughs> dominated. So that's supposed to give you this argument for uh, probabilism. So what it relies on, I mean, okay, so. And the thing to notice here, the thing that I really want to flag up, is the form that this argument takes. Um, so it appealed to a notion of inaccuracy, a measure of inaccuracy, and a decision theoretic norm. Here's the decision theoretic norm. And this is the decision theoretic norm stated in full generality. So when we've been dealing with it, we've been dealing with um, assigning utilities or the notion of utility here is the notion of accuracy, sort of epistemic utility, how much epistemic goodness a, a credence function get. We've been assigning utilities, epistemic utilities, to credence functions. But of course, in general, in decision theory, one assigns utilities, be they epistemic or otherwise, to other sorts of options like um, actions or outcomes or something like that. So here's this in its full generality. If you've got some option A that dominates some other option B, um, relative to you, what that means is that in every single world, um, B is worse than you. Okay, and here's the norm. Suppose you've got um, A dominating B relative to that utility function, then and nothing dominating A relative to that utility function, 
then B is irrational if U is your utility function. Okay, so that's just it's just re-saying what I've been saying before. But this, the point is that there's a very general norm of decision theory that's used not just to evaluate your credence functions, as I've been doing, but also just to evaluate your actions. Okay, so this gives us the sort of form that the argument takes. It starts with a characterization of inaccuracy measures. And you might think of that as sort of measuring your epistemic disutility. It measures how badly you're doing, epistemically speaking, um, at a particular world. And that's going to be measured by the Breyer school. Um, and then it's got a decision theoretic norm, the one that we just had, the dominance norm. And then it's got a mathematical theorem, which shows that basically, <coughs> relative to the inaccuracy measure here, you satisfy the decision theoretic norm if and only if you satisfy probabilism. And therefore, the conclusion is probabilism. So the argument's valid. I mean, you can, you can definitely argue over this premise, this one perhaps less so, but people have. Um, have had concerns about this. This one's a mathematical theorem, so you certainly can't argue against that. Um, so that's the sort of form of the argument. And the reason I'm putting it up in this sort of explicit form is what I want to do for the rest of the talk is go through trying to adapt this form of argument to give arguments for different epistemic norms. So this argument is to a greater or lesser extent the argument that Jim Joyce gives in his 1998 paper. Um, Though he doesn't spell, he doesn't make it really quite as explicit as this, or um, or, or lay it out like this. But this is essentially the form of the argument. And what I want to show is that you can try to. So, so a natural question comes up: Which other epistemic norms can we justify in this manner, just by appealing to uh, considerations of accuracy? Um, and the and the answer is you know, quite a few. And then the question is: So what is it exactly that we change in order to? Um, to, to give a different epistemic norm out here at the bottom, what do we have to put in differently up at the top? So you might think, well, maybe if you change the measure of inaccuracy, that's going to give something different. You know, I measure inaccuracy in a, in a different way, I get out some totally different norm down at the bottom. Turns out that doesn't actually really happen terribly much. This result is not it, it is, is, is robust. Um, there's a sort of vast array of different measures of inaccuracy that you could put it up at the top, and you get out exactly the same norm at the bottom. So that's not really um, a, a, an open option. Um, but what we are going to do is switch around this bit. Okay? We're going to pull out this decision theoretic norm and put in other ones. And it's worth noting that the ones that we'll put in in its place will be more controversial than the one that we've just stated. In some ways, sort of think of this as the bedrock in, in decision theory. It's, there are no, other, no norms that are m less controversial than this. this is um, the sort of uh, the most plausible one, and the other ones I'm going to state are in some ways less plausible. But in some ways, I think that's good because the epistemic norms that come out at the end are slightly less plausible. I still think they're correct, and I still think the decision theoretic norm is correct. But I can see that they ha they have slightly less plausibility than dominance, which is in some way, um, if, if you don't accept dominance, there's there's some sense in which you haven't really understood what rationality is. Okay, I'm gonna, this is a generalization of the argument. I'm going to skip over it. Um, essentially what it does is it gives a different, uh, it generalizes the argument for different measures of inaccuracy. Um, it generalizes them in particular to what are called the strictly proper scoring rules. Um, okay, and I, I mean we can talk about those in questions if people like the mathematical level of a bit intricate and I don't think philosophically they're going to add an awful lot here, but maybe just flag up that there are different ways of characterizing inaccuracy, different ways of measuring inaccuracy, that will nonetheless give you the same um, results at the bottom, so give out the same epistemic norm at the bottom. Um, the, the Breyer score, the one that we've been using, is amongst those. It's also a strictly proper score, but there are lots and lots of other ones. I think I might be talking about some of them um, in the next talk. Okay. Um, so, what are these other norms that we're going to be interested in trying to justify? Well, here's a sort of <coughs> list of four, whether it's the most um, sort of popular four norms other than probabilism that people try to justify, I'm not sure, but they're certainly some of the major ones. And I sort of think of them as, as being the ones that provide um, <coughs> accounts of how we respond to evidence or how we set our priors in such a way that they're going to respond to evidence in a good way. So in some ways, you might think of them as giving a sort of nice Bayesian package. Um, 
package that's going to tell you uh, lots of ways of how one responds to evidence. I mean, I should also say that, I mean, very roughly speaking, together with probabilism um, and these two, you get out what John Williamson calls um, objective Bayesianism. To, to some extent, I mean, I know that's not entirely true and so on, but it's, it's, it's certainly in the same sort of vicinity. Um, uh, because of uh, the objectivism of his Bayesianism, he doesn't need conditionalization, in fact, um, which is an update rule. Um, but we, in fact, get it. And that's, in fact, much more what Isaac's going to be talking about. And I, 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 I may not get on to talking about that in total. But the idea here is um, that we're going to tweak <coughs> the decision theoretic norm, I should say, decision theoretic norm, or something. If we tweak the decision theoretic norm in this argument, can we then give out a different epistemic norm? And in particular, can we give out these epistemic norms? And the answer, I hope, is going to be yes. OK, so let's first up talk about the principle of indifference. Uh, I've given this talk before, and uh, people said this was perhaps not rhetorically the best one, because it's going to depend. And so in some ways, it's the most controversial one, which is trying to sort of ease people into your project. But there's sort of, for other dialectical reasons, I'm going to put it in first. So the principle of indifference is an enormously controversial principle in uh, Bayesian epistemology. And in its very simplest form, which is the form I'm going to talk about it here, it just says this. Um, so take all the different possible worlds, okay, or take, sorry, take two uh, possible worlds. Um, then you ought to assign, at the beginning of your epistemic life, the same credence to each of them. So the, the slogan here is assign credences equally to all prob uh, possibilities. Okay. Um, at the beginning of your epistemic life. So this is a, a way in which this principle differs from John Williamson's maximum entropy principle. Williamson thinks that the maximum entropy principle holds at every point in your epistemic life, however much evidence you have. <coughs> All I'm going to try to defend is the much weaker claim that it should hold at the beginning of your epistemic life. Now, in conjunction with, whoops, um, in conjunction with conditionalization, that will give you, in fact, a version of it that holds. Um, at other points, you have something like that. I'm not going to be so interested in that. OK, so here's the principle. You should assign the same probability to each possibility um, at the beginning of your epistemic life, before you gain any evidence at all. So what's the decision theoretic norm that we need to put in in our general argument in order to give this out? And the answer is another controversial norm, um, but this time in decision theory, called maxi-min, or some people call it mini-max. And the idea of maxi-min is that what you should try to do when you're choosing between a range of options is you should try to maximize the minimum utility that they will give out or minimize the maximum disutility that they should give out. That's why it gets called maxi-min and mini-max interchangeably. So I'm looking through a range of options. What I look at is not all the different utilities that they will give at different ways the world is. All I care about is how bad they could end up. I look, so e for each option, I look, at, I look through all the worlds and figure out what its worst utility is, its lowest utility is. And then I choose between the options by choosing, between the, one, uh, by choosing the one that has the highest lowest uh, probability, whose who's, who's worst case scenario is best. OK, so that's just essentially what, what this says. It's irrational to choose something if there's some other option whose worst case scenario is best, better than yours. So the point is it's a very, very risk averse norm. In fact, in many ways, it's the uber risk averse norm. It's the, the most extreme one. This is the most extremely risk averse agent will, will hold this. All that this agent cares about is the worst case scenario, and she wants to avoid, uh, or she, she wants to um, get the best possible outcome in the worst case scenario. That's what um, agents do. So it's going to turn out, in fact. So I mean, th throughout all of this, I'm going to be um, my account of the inaccuracy measures is that I'm, all I'm going to be assuming is that there are these strictly proper scoring rules. And I know I haven't talked about um, exactly mathematically what these are, but you can sort of think about this as just using the same inaccuracy measure we've used before, the, the quadratic or the, the Breyer score one. Um, but it just turns out it's a much greater range for which this sort of result shows. So suppose you make that assumption about the inaccuracy measures, and then you um, make that assumption that, that that decision theoretic norm that you're maximally risk averse, then it's going to turn out that 
satisfying that decision theoretic norm with respect to one of these inaccuracy measures is exactly the same as satisfying probabilism and the principle of indifference. So you get out at the end the uh, epistemic norm of probabilism and the principle of indifference. So, I mean, essentially what this is saying is the principle of indifference is a risk-averse epistemic norm. What it does is it ensures that in the worst-case scenario, your inaccuracy is best. So it goes through all the different credence functions and it looks, how, it looks at how inaccurate they are at each different possible world. And it asks, it doesn't survey all of those, it just picks out how inaccurate they're going to be in the worst possible case, how inaccurate they're going to be uh, at the worst, uh, in the world at which they're worst, and it picks the one that is best in its worst case scenario. And it's going to turn out that is precisely the sort of so-called uniform <coughs> distribution the one that assigns the same credence to each of the possibilities. Okay. If people are, yeah, we can talk more about, say, something like minimax or maxi min in the, in the questions. Next, um, the next principle I want to talk about is uh, Lewis's, uh, or, well, David Miller's uh, principle, so called principle principle, previously called Miller's principle. Um, but I think probably now largely known as the principle principle because Miller in fact thought it was contradictory so it would be sort of odd to defend a norm and name it after the person who, who thought it was contradictory so it now gets called the principle principle which is what David Lewis called it um, and this is a, 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 a norm that tells you how your credences in chance propositions should affect your credences in other propositions in particular how they should affect credences in propositions that the chances have something to say about so um, the idea is this. Suppose you've got um, a range of different possible chance functions. Okay? So these are supposed to be the ones that tell you exactly what the chances are of different events at, uh, in, the, in the world. Um, but you don't know which one's the correct one. One of, them, one of them amongst those is going to be the correct one. You know that, but you don't know which one. The other ones are going to be chance functions for other possible ones. Now the principal principle says roughly this. Um, Again, we're talking about initial credences. So, and, and this is how, how David Lewis thought about it, actually. He thought of the principal principles applying to what he called super babies. Uh, super babies are agents with no evidence whatsoever. They're right there at the beginning of their epistemic life. No evidence. Um, you can state it for other points in an agent's life, but it, it, um, it leads, you to, um, leads you to trouble often. Um, but, but there, are, there are consistent ways of stating it. But we're just going to focus on the case where the agent's at the beginning of their epistemic life. Okay, so what does the principle say? It says, well, my credence in A, conditional on the proposition that says that the, the true chances, the chances of this world, are given by this probability function, ought to just be whatever that probability function, that chance function, assigns to A. So your credence is in a proposition conditional on the chance in that proposition being 0.5 ought to be 0.5. Credence in A conditional on chance uh, being 0.7 ought to be 0.7. That's what the principal principle says. Um, now, in that form, Lewis also thought it was uh, inconsistent, um, or at least inconsistent on his particular understanding of what chances were, the so called Humean um, account of chances. Um, I'm not, I mean, and, and there are ways to sort of tweak it that allow you to get around some of those contradictions. And so on. I'm not going to be interested in those particular uh, complications. Um, but so let's just, this is it in its most basic form, and let's see if we can justify it in this form. Um, okay. Okay, so, so what do we do? Remember, we're doing the same thing again. We're going through our standard format for this argument, and we're pulling out the decision theoretic norm that we used before. First of all, it was dominance, then it was minimax, and now we're going to put in a new norm, and we're going to try to get out the principal principle. <coughs> yeah. And the norm we're going to be interested in is one that I think probably everybody agrees to, but I've never really seen given a name before. Um, so I'm going to call it chance dominance. Um, and it's the, so it's the following thing. Okay, so remember in the dominance situation, what you do is um, you look at the, the, the utility that each of the things, um, each of the two acts that you're considering, say, has at each world. And if it turns out that the first act is better than the second act to every single world, then you certainly shouldn't choose the second act. Now, chance dominance is a little bit like that. But what it does is it doesn't look at the utility at each world. 
What it does is instead it looks at the expected utility of each act by each of the different possible chance functions. So your chance functions are going to disagree on a whole bunch of things. You're going to disagree on what the particular chances are of different things, and conditional chances and all sorts of things. But it may be that they agree on this one thing. They agree that the expected utility of one act is, bet is higher than the expected utility of the other act. And in that very peculiar situation, it seems that you should not choose the second act. So, so you don't know that the first act is better than the second act in every situation, but you do know that every single possible chance function expects the first act to be better than it expects the second act to be. Um, so in that situation, it seems irrational to choose the second <coughs> act. You shouldn't choose some act where every single possible chance, function, whatever the objective chances are, obje expect something else to be better. Okay, that's chance dominance. It would be irrational to do that. If you put in chance dominance into your, your decision-theoretic norm um, uh, space, then you get out uh, probabilism and the principal principle. Again, with the same uh, facts about the inaccuracy measures. Okay. So that's the epistemic utility argument for the, uh, the principal principle. <coughs> um, Finally, I'm going to just talk a little bit, and probably a little bit too briefly and quickly, about um, the reflection principle and conditionalization. Um, so, um, and, they, and they go together very naturally. So, um, the story of the reflection principle is Van Frassen originally gives the reflection principle um, and, and shows the following, that there seems to be a Dutch book argument for the reflection principle that has very similar structure to the Dutch book argument for the uh, conditionalization. But then everybody thinks, oh, the reflection principle is a bit of a disaster, um, but we really like conditionalization. How are we going to get around this problem? Um, and, and some people have tried to do that. So Rachel Briggs has a fantastic paper called Distorted Reflection, where she tries to sort of just tease apart the two different arguments, the, ar the Dutch book argument for conditionalization and the Dutch book argument for reflection, and show how, in fact, although they look very similar, they are in fact different and we should accept one and reject the other. That's not what I'm going to be interested in here. I'm going to be interested in arguments for the reflection principle. And part of why that's interesting, the reflection principle, less interesting, but part of why it's interesting is Van Prassen later went on to show that in fact the reflection principle, stated in a particular way, is equivalent to conditionalization. Or something like that. Anyway, okay, so what does the reflection principle say? So the crucial thing about the reflection principle is just to think of it as exactly like the principal principle. But instead of chance functions, substitute in your future credence functions. So you don't know what your future credence functions are going to be. Um, let's suppose they could be any one of these uh, n different credence functions. And, suppose, and, and, and then the reflection principle says your credence in A now, currently, conditional on your future credences being given by this one should just be whatever your future credences are. So the idea is just that chances are some sort of expert that we defer to when we set our credences, so too are our future credences. They're things that somehow know are better in a better epistemic position than we are. Okay, so how do we give a justification for this? Well, unsurprisingly, given that they're sort of formally identical, um, you can give a justification for the reflection principle just as you gave one for the principal principle. And in this case, it's not chance dominance that we want. It's what I'm somewhat inelegantly going to call future credence dominance. So suppose you're in a situation where you've got an option, uh, two different options. And you don't know that one of them is strictly better than the other one in all worlds. But you do know that each of your possible future credence functions expects the first one to be better than it expects the second one to be. Then again, it seems irrational to do the second. Suppose we accept that principle. So that's just a kind of exact analog of the, uh, chance credence, uh, the, the chance dominance principle. Then, unsurprisingly, because the maths is just going to be exactly the same, you get out probabilism and the reflection principle. So that, okay, so that's how we're sort of supposed to justify the reflection principle. But it turns out that the reflection principle just entails conditionalization. If you're someone who has this attitude towards their future credences, then you will be inevitably planning to update by conditionalization. Now that's slightly different from the way you usually hear people talking about conditionalization. People talk about conditionalization as a norm which governs how you in fact update. 
But if you instead interpret it as a norm that governs how you plan to update, then, um, then, this, then this will hold. If you satisfy reflection, then you're, um, you must be planning to update by conditionalization. So what this does is it gives a justification for a conditionalization that goes via the justification for reflection. Now, that's one way of using this accuracy argument stuff to give a justification for um, conditionalization. There's another one, and that's what Lejac's going to be talking about later on, um, originally uh, given by uh, Greaves, uh, Hillary Greaves and David Wallace, um, and then uh, sort of adapted in a particular way by Hannah Sleitgave and myself. Um, but that, that's a slightly different way of justifying conditionalization. Um, uses different bits of maths and uses a different decision theoretic norm, in fact. But I thought, given that we're going to hear about that later on, um, I'll, I'll give this alternative way of justifying. And in fact, there are some other nice um, accuracy theoretic ways of, of, of justifying conditionalization as well. We can talk about if people are interested. So the upshot of all this is that there's a whole bunch of, um, of these epistemic norms, norms that you want um, to justify sort of classic Bayesian norms, norms that govern how your credences um, should behave and particularly how they should respond to evidence or how they should prepare you to respond to evidence. A whole bunch of those norms that you can justify purely by paying attention to the virtue of accuracy. So part of the purpose of this project is to show... So, so part of what I want to defend in all of this is that um, accuracy is the sole... Uh, source of epistemic value for credences. It's the only way that credences can get their goodness. It's not that responding to evidence is some sort of other goodness that credences can get. All of the goodness they get is by being accurate. <coughs> and part of the way that you want to prove that is to show that it can do important work. That that thesis can do important work. And part of the important work is to justify norms that we wish to justify. So you take norms like probabilism, principle, principle, conditionalization, and so on, principle of indifference, and ask, is there a way to justify them just by appealing to this notion of accuracy? And that's what I've been trying to do here. So this is one of these projects that's, so it's been going for a while. I mean, it, was, it had a sort of funny history that there was this Joyce paper in 1998, and then there was basically silence for about 10 years. And then a bunch of people, Hillary Greaves and David Wallace and... Um, and it's like giving myself and a bunch of others. Some other people wrote some papers around it, and suddenly it's begun to sort of flourish a bit. And, and that 98 paper of Joyce is sort of getting the recognition I think it deserves. It's a really fantastic paper. Um, but there's still a huge amount of work to be done in it. So, for instance, how do all of these arguments change if you allow in um, an infinite uh, set of propositions to which you assign uh, credences? Uh, for instance, can you justify the countable additivity norm? What happens if you allow infinitesimals in the range of your credence functions? Can you justify certain norms to do with that? Um, what about updating norms? And actually, this is sort of directly what um, I will talk about. How, how do you update uh, your credences? How should you update your credences when the evidence you get doesn't just come in in the form of a proposition that you learn with certainty, but may come in in, in other forms, certain other constraints in your future credences? Could we ever give... Um, uh, an argument for regularity, the, the thesis that you should never have zero credence in anything other than a contradiction. Um, uh, is there a way of giving a version of probabilism that weakens the logical consequence axiom, a logical omniscience axiom? The axiom essentially means that agents must assign credence one to all logical truths and zero to all logical falsehoods. Is there a way of just giving some um, notion of accuracy? that allows us to justify some weaker version of probabilism like that. What happened, I've been talking entirely about credences and how we justify norms for credences, but there are all sorts of other doxastic states out there. There's fool beliefs, comparative probabilities, imprecise credences. What's the correct measure of inaccuracy for these, and how can we give justifications? There's actually some really interesting results known about imprecise credences. In fact, there's no such thing as a strictly proper scoring rule for imprecise credences. And recently, Brandon Feitelson, David McCarthy, and, um, and uh, Kenny Iswaran have given, have been sort of interested in these former two questions, and I've got some sort of initial <laughs> results on that. There's a lot of low-hanging fruit around a lot of open problems. Okay, thank you very much.
good. No, that's an excellent question. So actually, that's, that, that could have gone up in open problems as well. But um, so it's known. Uh, so in some ways, everything hangs on it in order to get probabilism. So there's a question. So I mean, part of the beauty of the framework is it's sort of a bit like plug and play. You can sort of take out one component and put in another and then see what happens. So suppose instead of these um, classically consistent worlds, I put in, um, you know, I, I allowed my possible worlds to be ones that were, say, consistent in intuitionistic logic or logic of paradox or something like that. What would be the result? Um, what, what sort of norms would I get out? And so this has been investigated a little bit by uh, Robbie Williams. Um, and it turns out that you get this very nice notion of generalized probabilism, which is, uh, was originally formulated by Jeff Paris, where Paris gives this um, definition of what, probabilism, what the probabilistic norm should be with different non-classical logics as their background. So basically, I mean, basically what you do is you just restate what look exactly like the probability axioms using a consequence relation. And then whatever your logic's consequence relation is, put that in place and that gives you... And so it turns out you can give accuracy justifications for each of those um, as well. Um, and this is, so it's essentially based on the fact. So what Paris was doing was he was interested in what would the norms be that you could give Dutch book arguments for if your logic was something other than classical logic. And, um, and it turns out that the maths behind the Dutch book arguments is very close to the maths behind in these accuracy arguments. And so pretty much whenever you can give a Dutch book argument or something, you can translate it over to giving an accuracy argument for it. Um, I mean, this is an observation originally due to De Finetti, actually. But, um, yeah, the yeah, so uh, mathematically, at least. I mean, I, I kind of like to think that the philosophically, they're very distinct. They're sort of looking at different... Um, different roles that credences might play, but mathematically it turns out actually you use the same theorems in order to, um, to prove each one. Um, <coughs> so it's, I mean essentially what the whole thing boils down to is that if you take that set of um, what I was calling the sort of um, perfect credence functions, the ideal ones, which are essentially the valuations, you know, the logical valuation functions, um, if you take those and then take the convex hull of them, Okay, so the smallest convex set of them that contains them. It turns out that those are precisely the probability functions. And then it also turns out that mathematically what you want to do in both Dutch boot cases and accuracy cases is whenever you have a point outside the convex hull, find a point within the convex hull that's closest to it. That's just exactly the same thing. I mean, when you look at the kind of maths behind Dutch book arguments, that's essentially what you're doing when you figure out what bet is going to Dutch book the person. And so that same bit of math kind of goes on with both of them. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, so, so first you give this story about dominance, right? You get a nice pictorial representation and you see what's going on there. But then, you know, the engine of dominance in the first case is actually replaced by the engine of maximin and yeah. the engines of doing expect various kinds of expectations yeah. in, the, in the third and the fourth case. Um, now, dominance, you kind of feel that, yeah, that really does have a feel. But, you know, the maximin as extreme risk aversion and then expectations as being very different from the maximin. Yeah. I mean, sort of, where does the appeal come from? And, and just to help me out here, see things maybe a bit more pictorially, can you do the picture too for the maximin and the, the <laughs> expectations? Um, well, well, so for the maximin, um, so it's sort of a question about, okay. you know, how can you motivate these alternative principles because dominance is so convincing. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I mean, pictorially, I don't think I'm going to... I don't think pictures are necessarily going to convince you with the maximum, but essentially what's going on is this. Suppose you've got... So this is just the two-proposition case, okay? So you've only got previous say, A, which go along that way, and not A, um, which go up that way. Okay, and here's the probability function. And they're all the ones that where the credence in A and the credence in not A sum up to 1. Now the probabilism argument is if you sit off this, then there's something on it that's closest to this world and closest to this world, closest to the A world, closest to the world. So that's the problem, that's the dominance argument. The maximin argument, of course, so what you want is to show that the, this is the 0.5, 0.5 one. Um, 
So that's your, that's your principle, that's your uniform distribution there. Why is that one the maximum in one? Well, if you suppose you pick any other probabilistic Green's function, well, sure, this one will do better at this world, but it will do worse at this world than this one did. So the worst case scenario for this one is the one, uh, is the, um, it, it happens in both of them. It's equally far away from them in both of them. So that's the, that's the, that's the worst case scenario for it. And for any other one, sure, it might do better. But it may also, but it will also do worse um, at some other world, and therefore, if it does worse at some other world, then it will be worse than its worst case scenario will be worse than, than that one. So that's the picture, but I'm not sure that necessarily um, speaks to the um, appeal of it. So, so, so part of the reason I, I, I took it to apply only <coughs> in the, um, for the agent at her initial state. Is it that it's something a bit like um, Rawls has appealed to it um, when he's trying to um, use it in theory of justice? That maximin is a principle that one uses prior to getting any evidence and indeed prior to having any probabilities at all. So the thought is, um, you know, behind the veil of ignorance for Rawls, it's not just that you. Um, don't know how the world's going to turn out to be. You don't have any credences even of the possible ones. So you can't do the Harsani move of just taking expected, you know, maximizing your expected um, utility when you're picking your way society is going to be from behind the veil of ignorance. You've got to do something um, else. And Rawls thinks that maximum is, is sort of the plausible thing to do. It's plausible to be risk averse in that position before you've got any credence at all. As soon as you have credences, just use maximize expected utility. But before you have any, you do that. Now, you may still think that's not terribly plausible. Of course, you know, why from behind the veil of ignorance should you be very, very risk averse rather than very risk seeking or risk neutral or something like that? Um, I mean, I think here it's, there you're sort of arguing around <coughs> bedrock, and it's probably if one isn't convinced to begin with, then it's not going to be an awful lot more to say. But in that case, you might just think of this as illustrating the connection between risk aversion. And, um, and the principle of indifference. Because, I, and in some ways I was hoping that this would get to the heart of what some people seem to think is right about principle of indifference. What's wrong about going beyond your evidence? Why would it be such a bad thing to go beyond your evidence? Well, it seems that the only thing that could be wrong is that you risk doing something. You risk some sort of badness. What's the badness that you risk? It seems that it would be having higher inaccuracy than you needed to have. You could have done something else where you had no risk of having inaccuracy at that time. So that's, that's meant to be the sort of rough idea behind it. But I'd be sort of happy if <coughs> what this really establishes the condition of if you satisfy maximum and then you should uh, satisfy the principle of indifference. I mean, certainly Jim Joyce, when I was talking to him about it, said, oh, this is good news because I've always you know, hated both of those principles and now I know why, my, why it's a connection to um, the, the, the expected, using expectations, I mean, that's, that really is supposed to just be um, appealing to some sort of intuitive uh, notions. Again, for someone who doesn't have any, um, any sort of subjective criticism in that point, but they know what the different possible objective criticisms are, but they don't have some distribution over those different possible objective ones. What's something they could do in that situation? Well, so one thing they could do is ask of each of those ones whether there's anything, uh, so if they're choosing between two options, if it turns out that each of them agrees that this one's better than this one, then it seems, I mean, that's going to be an unusual situation to be in, but it does turn out to be the situation that you're in if you violate mm. the principal principle. There's some other credence function that every chance function will expect to be more accurate than it expects your one to be, and that seems to be a reason. But maybe that's not too Can we move on to the Kate?
It's not the case for the principle of indifference one. It is the case for the chance dominance. So it depends on a bit. You, what you can do is give different weightings to things relative to their logical strength. But if you weight everything of the same logical strength equally, then you'll still get this out. You basically have to assign weights to them in a way that's symmetric with respect to their logical strength. That's the, and then you get out the uniform, uniform distribution. Right. Exactly. Yeah. But if you have some, if you have kind of pragmatics in the background, yeah. I mean, yeah. th that's where the weighting. And I guess you might think that um, not just pragmatics, but something to do with intrinsic um, interest. You know, re not regard so you know, you might think that knowing facts about how the universe will end are intrinsically more interesting <laughs> and thus more valuable to be accurate about than facts about how many blades of grass there are on my lawn yeah. or something. Um, but that's nothing to do with me. It's not gonna make any difference to me knowing how the, the universe is going to end. Um, um, so, you know, um, but, but nonetheless, you might want to make this weighting. So, it's, so I think there's even more force to the point you're making that it need to just be pragmatic considerations that will introduce those weightings. Yeah. Uh, Raphael? Well, uh, in the, of course, the name of the game is to do foundational stuff around probabilism and biasity and so on, but I'm curious about applications outside of this fairly narrow field. So is it the case that for some of the tricks or techniques or kind of insights uh, that you get when you work on this can uh, be interesting for people you know, doing something else in Bayesian or something else that just find the Sure, sure. I, yeah, so there is. So yes, yeah, so the, um, I mean, in a slightly different context, I mean, it often happens when when does formal work in philosophy, you kind of realize that actually there was a, there was a subfield of statistics or computer science that was all doing in the 70s. Um, this is sort of true here as well, that there's, um, there's a whole, I mean, particularly people like Phil David in statistics um, has been doing a lot of work on these scoring rules and how you use them. And there are really lovely results about when you should use one measure of inaccuracy rather than another for very practical problems. So there's a great paper by a Hungarian mathematician called Imre Shizar, who has this useful axiomatization that tells you when you should use a logarithmic inaccuracy measure, essentially, or when you should use a quadratic one, which is the one I was sort of demonstrating there. And he gives this, these different axiomatizations for the two and says, well, look, if you were doing this particular very practical problem, for instance, mm -hmm. recreating image, um, you know, sort of image reconstruction from, uh, from minimal data, um, then you should use this because <coughs> it satisfies this, it uniquely satisfies this axiom, whereas if you're doing this other complex problem in statistics which uses Bayesian methods, then you should use uh, this other one. So, I mean, it's not something that I, I know an enormous amount about, but there is a lot of um, sort of stuff. Well, no, actually, that's, that's not even strictly true. There's not a lot of stuff written, but there's some really, really high quality stuff written on how you might choose which um, measure. You know, because essentially something similar, what's going on here is something similar to this, um, actually, which came up in Matthias' talk, which I wasn't here for, but um, of using mean squared error as your way of measuring how far off something, uh, how far off the correct result an estimator is. So why use mean squared? What's so special about taking the difference in squaring? And again, this is our thing sort of shows you the certain, um, certain sorts of problems. It does make sense to use that certain sort of problems as other methods. Work well, so it's actually very, some ways, very practical. Like using quadratic rules because it is uh, it makes it more difficult, the less sensible to be to choose for the weather forecast or something like that, right? So, so there is there is that 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 issue. Although all of these will have that property, the, the logarithmic one, and these other ones called the spherical one, and so on, all have this property that they give if you if you're being punished according to your inaccuracy. So if someone's docking your salary according to how inaccurate you are. Then you you have an incentive to report your true credence, which is one of the properties that 
Breyer noticed about his score, but in fact it turns out it's true of a whole range of other ones. Uh, in fact, in some ways that's what defines what strictly proper means. All right. Thank you very much. Let's thank our speaker again.